one on the left. Well, that was hardly a typical incident of my visit to Pakistan. It's the second largest country in the Commonwealth, and Karachi, its chief city, is a swollen, ugly place with nearly two million people. Ancient and modern, camels and Cadillacs are cheek by jowl. It brought to life for me one of Asia's biggest problems, how to adapt a poor and in many ways backward people to the demands of an industrial age. The people still cherish the ancient traditions of the East. The gardens where I found this cobra were built by the British Raj. British rule has come and gone, but snake charming goes on the same. So does the use of camels for irrigation in a land where water is scarce. The camel is blindfolded lest it go on strike if it saw just how little progress it was making. And a few yards from the camel, a giant dam provided a strange contrast in methods of irrigation. Some people lead western lives, others are tied by the old customs still. In Karachi, alcohol is legal but brothels are banned. In Lahore, it's the other way round. Those two women are still in strict Muslim purdah like most women in Pakistan. But this too is changing and later we'll show you some pretty faces without their veils. This is Lahore, ancient capital of the Mughal emperors. The mosque is the largest in Islam. The gardens and palaces are memorials to mighty kings. The new buildings are less beautiful but impressively modern like this police station. In the big cities I saw a building boom on every side. Karachi's population has quadrupled since the war. It stretches for miles, half Americanized and half primitive. To build Western-style democracy in villages like these has meant a bitter struggle against poverty and illiteracy. The previous regime failed completely. Pakistan is a country split in two halves. This partition gave India's Muslims their own nation but made government nearly impossible. West Pakistan, with the national capital in Karachi, stole all the limelight. Then in 1958 came revolution. The army took over. Karachi's railway station at night with its huge electric sign, Pakistan Democracy, was recently the starting point of the first major campaign by President Ayub Khan and his new military regime to restore democracy, but of a new type. President Ayub toured the country by special train, explaining his plans to the people and to the journalists and writers, Pakistan and foreign, who went with him. I was one of them. It was the smartest public relations job I've ever seen, and the most luxurious train, complete with early morning tea served in one's comfortable bunk. As we saw the people acclaim their president, I learned why he had seized power. The government and the civil service had been steeped in corruption and the economy was cracking. So the army dissolved parliament and proclaimed martial law. Now there's a kind of benevolent dictatorship, but with little sign of militarism. The regime has punished the corrupt and is still generally popular. Now Ayub is holding elections for local councils, which he hopes to build up to a presidential system based on indirect suffrage. He believes that this is more suited to Asia than Western-style parliamentary democracy. On the train, I asked him why he and the former president, Mirza, had suspended the regime. Um, our people were frustrated. They felt that it was a perfectly good people, good country being ruined, uh, perhaps by the people who were responsible for running the country or the system. Anyhow, they were extremely dissatisfied with all this. So it was a question of saving the future of this country that he declared an emergency and abrogated the, the constitution. And having done that, then he had to declare martial law and he called upon me as the head of the army uh, to administer the martial law. Do you plan to restore democracy in the long run? Yes, yes, this is exactly what we are doing now. The, the basic democracy is the first step. Um, we are trying to bring democracy down to the lowest level of the people so that they are associated with administration, associated with future developments. They have a feeling of participation 
they learn responsibility and self-respect and cohesion. And later on, we hope that these elected people uh, that be elected during the course of these basic democracies will form the electoral college for the election of the parliament and the president. Would you like to see other Asian countries following your example? I wouldn't uh, force my ideas on anybody, but uh, they are most welcome to come and have a look at these things. And if it suits them, uh, we should be only too pleased to explain. And, and they, if they adopt them, maybe that it, uh, their problems may well be solved in the same fashion. But before this type of democracy can be established, uh, a government has to be strong enough to eradicate a lot of other evils, lot of sort of reforms that we have introduced without uh, land reforms, without legal reforms, educational reforms, reforms of that nature. You, you haven't really relieved the people of normal anxieties to be able to think of the future. How long will it take before martial law ends and democracy is fully at work again? Yes, well, my, my own uh, timetable is that if everything goes all right, by the end of 1960, we should have uh, democracy installed in full. And as soon as uh, our, uh, the, the legislature or the parliament meets, uh, that be the time to withdraw martial law. If anyone called you a military dictator, how would you answer? Well, I'll say he's talking bloody rubbish, that's all. <laughs> he doesn't know what he's talking about. <laughs> Somebody did charge me with a military dictator. How would you describe yourself, sir? Well, I describe myself as a, as a citizen of Pakistan who feels for this country, uh, also knows the problem with this country, and the problems of this country are that we got to advance under a democratic setup, um, which we can understand and work. And uh, that is the dictate of the history of the past, that's the lesson of the history, that only those people who have a um, certain measure of freedom and equality can progress. I'm sure of that, and I think uh, uh, I'm devoted to that cause. Mm -hmm. So therefore, a lot of these things that I do are really to stimulate people's interest towards that type of thinking, get them to, to build a team, a whole country as a team, and move forward.